Before we dive into these chapters today, let's talk very briefly about a teaching skill that you can practice and keep working on for as long as you live. It's this idea of asking questions that will help your students get involved, that will engage them in the lesson. Have you ever been in a class where a teacher asks a question and you can almost hear the crickets and see the tumbleweed blowing by and nobody's saying anything and it gets kind of awkward? Mm -hmm. um, maybe the question was too easy, maybe the question was too hard, or maybe the question was just so irrelevant that nobody even cared to even think about what the what the answer might be. So one of the, the skills that, that is helpful is to ask questions that will actually cause your students to open their scriptures or open their phone and look at the scriptures on their phone and engage. When, when you see all those heads go down, you know that was a good question. Yeah, and that's kind of fun to watch that happen. And believe me, I've seen in, as in my teaching, I've done some things where I was so excited and I saw three of 32 heads go into the scriptures and I thought, ah, I've also had those moments where it's done right where you invite them to search in the scriptures and the next thing you know, you've got all these eyes connected to the scripture text. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So these are going to be uh, often search level kinds of questions where you, you ask, you set up a scenario and then you, you leave, you create a vacuum Vacuums like to be filled, right? Mm -hmm. Where you you ask a question, where the the way they're going to fill that vacuum is by finding the words on the page that that answer that question you've asked. So, ponder how you could you could more deeply engage your students by asking great search level questions. So, for our scriptures today, you'll notice there there are a lot of miracles. This is kind of a continuation of last week's lesson in many, many ways. So we're going to get the palsied man who's lowered through the roof by four friends and Jesus is going to forgive his sins and then heal him. We're going to get the story of Jesus casting out a legion of devils out of a man and those devils go into 2,000 pigs. Um, then we get the story of Jairus petitioning for a miracle and in all of the gospel accounts, you get this miracle within the miracle. So Jairus gets Jesus to start coming towards his house, and in all of the accounts, there's this woman with an issue of blood that's right in the middle that kind of is, is superimposed over that, that miracle with Jairus and his daughter, and then you get the conclusion of that miracle when Jairus's daughter is going to be raised from the dead. And then we'll finish with some ideas surrounding Matthew chapter 10 with Jesus calling the 12 apostles to the ministry. So we'll jump in first with Mark chapter 5 verses 24 to 34 in the context of the woman with the issue of blood. So let's paint the picture that you, you created a minute ago, whether it's our class or our home, that the intent is to create in the student or the learner a desire to look in and search, in this case, search for words in the verses. It might look like this, where we start off with our class and say, okay, you ready? We're going to get a taste of English today. What is a verb? What's a verb? And have that discussion, make it fun, connect a verb to an action, right? And then you can say, okay, think about two or three verbs or actions that you've done today. What are they? And just have fun with that. What are the action verbs that, that might describe what you've done so far today? Once you start uh, connecting verbs to action to their lives, you then can share any of these three principles that we've heard uh, over our lifetime. Faith is a principle of action. Faith without works is dead. Acting in faith and let them start to connect in their minds faith in the Lord Jesus Christ with actual action on my part and how well they go hand in hand. You could use, for example, the experience of Joseph, uh, of Joseph Smith, 
we often rush right to he had a question, he prayed, and he was visited by the Father and the Son, which is absolutely true. But I want to skim through Joseph Smith history, verses 10 through about 15, and I want to emphasize what Joseph understood in the context of it. It wasn't just his faith, but there was action involved. When he says in verse 10, as I had these questions in my mind, his qu one of his questions was, what is to be done? Verse 11, I was thus laboring. I was one day reading. Can you hear these action words that we're seeing with Joseph? Um, I reflected on it again and again. How to act, I did not know. I came to the conclusion, verse 13, I must do, verse 13. So I retired to the woods, verse 14, for amidst all my anxieties, I had never as yet made the attempt to pray vocally. Uh, verse 15, I had retired to a place where I had previously designed I knelt down. Can you see all those action words that Joseph does before he even gets to that beautiful morning asking a question? He did some things prior. So in that context of action words and faith, let's now go back to math or Mark chapter 5. And this might be a simple question you could ask your students to search the scriptures. Will you take a couple of minutes on your own with groups, in companions, whichever one you feel is best, will you find 10 action verbs? We're going to study today a beautiful experience with a woman who has had a disease, and she's going to go to the Savior and be healed. Will you study verses 24 through 34 of Mark 5 and see if you can't identify, search for 10 action words. Circle them, highlight them on your phones and see if you can't find not only the miracle of the Savior, but what the woman did in order to be healed. That, that, and then just watch. And hopefully if we've done it right, we can get as many people going from looking at us as teachers or parents to now looking in the text to begin to learn from the scriptures themselves. I love that, Clint, because what, what it is, is you're helping your students or your children see the difference between an event, like you modeled with Joseph Smith. We, we want to jump to the big conclusion, and by doing that, we miss the beauty and the power of seeing the process of discipleship, of, of what it what it does to us as we don't just instantly get the answer. And this woman just instantly getting a certain event occurring, but then there was more that she had to go through a process with Jesus of. Powerful in a, in a world of, of instantaneous communication and instantaneous answers and results and events to help people slow down and analyze the, the beauties of daily scripture yeah. study, of pondering during the sacrament, of going yeah. to the temple, of family scripture study, of coming to Sunday school or young men's or young women's or primary, whatever the situation yeah. may be. The process of discipleship is beautifully portrayed here. Yeah, and last week we talked about the Savior and the miracles, and we studied the miracles and looked for characteristics of the Savior. That's a beautiful approach. This is just a different approach. We're also studying a miracle, but we're saying, okay, not just what did the Savior do, but in this case, what did the woman do? Listen to some of these verbs. Suffered, spent, heard, came, touched, fearing, trembling, fell down, told. Those are some beautiful action verbs that help us see, in, in some cases, the Savior, like the woman at the well, the Savior finds the woman. In this case, it's actually the woman that goes to the Savior, and you can see the beautiful application that can be found. As we then consider, can you think of a time in your life when you experienced a blessing, but it's because you did something. As teachers and parents, it might be wise to think of a time or a testimony 
where we can say, can I share an experience with you, uh, children, of a time in my life where I saw the Savior's hand in my life, but emphasize what it is that you did to precede the miracle, your action, your faith. I love that. The other thing that's beautiful here is to see the human element. Um, it, it becomes more relatable. They can, they can feel more connected to this woman when, they, when they're looking for these, these verbs, these actions, as well as as they see her, her emotions, what she's feeling, and to, to ask them to visualize that. And then what might be fun is once you've analyzed this story to say, hmm, this is a, this was a story that is always sandwiched between another story, and then to have them zoom out from her story now that it's complete and say, there's another individual standing in the street that day, and he's probably feeling some emotions as well. And then you have them go back to verse 22 and 23 and see if they can very quickly search for what is Jairus possibly feeling at this moment? Give some words to describe his his emotion or his state of being. And the idea of having your, your daughter, 12-year-old daughter, mm -hmm. on the point of death, and you're a ruler of the synagogue. You're one of the leaders of the people, and you know that you nor none of your colleagues can fix your daughter, but you've watched Jesus heal others. You know he can do it. So you go and you get him, and he agrees to come and heal your daughter. Now you can talk about the Oh, the relief emotion of, hey, there's hope. Mm -hmm. But then you, you ask them what would happen if you're Jairus to your emotion in verse 24. So there's an example of a simple question that hopefully, if it's asked right, in the right setting, where students are like, what do you mean? And they go to verse 24 and read it, and Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And you can say, okay, if you're Jairus, now how are you feeling? Your, your daughter's dying, and you're being thronged. And then you get this story of the woman with the issue of blood where Jesus, and you say, okay, um, what would you say about Jairus' emotion in verse 30? Jesus, immediately knowing in himself the virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? What might Jairus be thinking? It's that idea of, of allowing these people to become more than 2D, two-dimensional names on the page to become more real, where they can almost picture him in their mind. And what might he be doing? If you're making a movie of this, what might he be doing? That would be a fun way that you could work your way through this story. And then, after he finishes with the woman and he's completed the process of her being made whole, then to have somebody come and say, oh, Jairus, by the way, don't bother him anymore. Your, your daughter just barely died. Yeah. And now the emotions. And then to watch Jesus heal, not only go and raise her from the dead, but prop up Jairus's faith and to keep moving forward even when it feels like I've got nothing else to hold on to. She's dead. And how Jesus uh, helps him. So to look for the verbs in verse 35 through 43, you can look at the verbs of Jesus, the verbs of Jairus, and the verbs of the group that's in Jairus's house and because three very different yeah, responses. It is. You're going to see some verbs in that group in his home that aren't as encouraging. But I read those and I think, oh, sometimes that's me, right? Sometimes that's me. Um, I really like how you framed that so well, these be two beautiful miracles right sandwiched in between each other. Here's an idea, again, another idea as we're trying to look for ways to help students or children or youth or adults search scriptures. You may begin again. I'm gonna. I don't know if it's Jairus or Jairus. I'm just gonna be the rebel and say Jairus. Is that okay? That's great. <laughs> okay, and you can use which whatever you pronounce. It's right. 
That's right. That's right. Okay. So using the example of Jarius, for example, you could start off by with your youth or with your classes say, okay, do you know what the definition of a phobia is? What's a phobia? I had to look it up. Here it is. An anxiety disorder involving excessive fear of a situation or object, right? We all know what it's like to be afraid or to be scared, and that's what a phobia is. So we've talked about this in the past. You can use thumbs up, thumbs down to kind of get a yes or a no. You could use different phobias like, who can tell me what arachnophobia is? We'll start off easy, right? How many of you have arachnophobia? And granted, they're gonna, some will know that it's the fear of spiders, some may not. Uh, you could then say, okay, what's the, f what is acrophobia? That's the fear of heights. Same thing. How many of you have acrophobia? Just talk about different phobias. Claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces. Here's, here's one, sinophobia, the fear of dogs. How many of you have sinophobia? And here's one that I'm less familiar with. In fact, I hope I can even pronounce this phobia. Trypanophobia is the fear of needles. How many of you have the fear of needles? Get them talking about what's, what they're afraid of, what brings to them fear. Then you can ask a simple question like this. Will you look in verses 21 to 23 and verse 35? Can you see if you can discover in those verses what Jairus's fear is? What's his fear? Because if you look in verse 36, the Savior is going to use one of the most powerful phrases of phobias. Be not afraid, only believe. He can sense this fear. What's his fear? And then let them study and then just watch them study and say, okay, it's probably not the fear of spiders, probably not the fear of needles, but he is very concerned and afraid of something. What is it? And then let them discover the context of the fear. I love, I love this, this whole exercise of letting them talk about fear in a general sense, then fear in a more personal sense. What, what are my fears? What are my phobias? And then this idea of if I bring my fears to the Savior, then he can help turn those fears into faith. God has not given us the spirit of fear. They're going to experience fear naturally. It's part of life. But as they, as they make the resolve that I'm going to use action words, verbs, mm -hmm. of what have these people done to come unto Christ? What is the process of my discipleship of coming to him to allow him to turn yeah. those fears into faith? That's a powerful... Uh, a powerful lesson for all of us moving forward to not be victims yeah. of our fears, but to be able to act on them. Yeah, yeah, that phrase, in fact, um, be not afraid, only believe, right? Be not afraid, only believe. Is that how it is in that verse, Tyler? Okay, so that's a common phrase. In fact, you might even choose to then say, all right, notice this beautiful, the Savior just takes a moment. And you can imagine what Jarius is feeling at this point, right? Where he's hoping to get and allow his daughter to be healed. It's, there's traffic. It's taking him longer. Than, well, it's not the traffic. It's the love of the Savior. And you could sense the Savior, be not afraid, only believe. It might be fun to then have your students study the rest of those verses and then maybe, oh, I'm sorry, Tyler, I'm going to erase this. Is that okay? I'm not afraid of that. <laughs> to have, put this on the board and then do this. Will you study these verses and finish this statement? If you were Jarius' mother or his father... How would you finish this statement that the Savior would say to him right then as he's just seen this woman healed, but he's also just found out his daughter's passed away? Jarius, be not afraid. Only believe in. How would you finish this statement? 
and then let the youth study these verses. Let your class study these verses and then finish that how you would finish that. That is a beautiful opportunity. You're going to see different people finish that in different ways. Then, once they finish that statement in the context of these verses, um, and you'll have to do this with great sensitivity. I've seen teachers that know their students so well. Clearly, parents know their youth so well. I remember being in a class about a month and a half ago um, when I watched a teacher, she, I was so surprised at how well she knew so many of her students. If she were teaching in these verses, I can see her say, asking questions like this. All right, will you finish the statement? And then she'd know her students. She'd be listening to the Spirit. She'd then say to, for example, a student named Taylor, Taylor, um, we know as a class that in the last couple of months you've lost your mother. How would you finish that statement with the experience that you've been through? How would you finish that statement, be not afraid, only believe in what? What have you learned through this experience? Matt, you just blew out your knee last month in football, and you didn't get to play the last two or three games of your senior season. You're preparing for a mission. You're going to be on a mission in a few months. How would you finish this statement? And allow youth to think then not just about the experience of, of the woman with the issue of blood or about Jairus' daughter, but have them think in their, in their minds, how would I finish this statement? That yes, I need to be not afraid, but only I do need to believe in and then just listen to them and encourage them. And then you might even be prepared to share something where you uh, share an experience where you were, there may have, may have been fear, but because of your belief, hopefully in the Savior himself, you were able to make it through that experience with faith. I just love this statement to not only just put a period by it, but to also allow that to be the root of revelation. It's, you've heard of power phrases. Well, this is one of the power phrases of Scripture where Jesus himself is saying to Jairus in a moment of intense mm -hmm. uh, uncertainty, and emotional outpouring, be not afraid, yeah. only believe. Yeah, one, one quick thing, Tyler, uh, just because it came to my mind, that experience that I mentioned uh, a little while ago with that teacher, do you know what came out of the student's mouth when she asked a similar question? She, her statement was, and it wasn't this exact statement, but her statement of testimony was, as I've gone through this experience that this young woman shared, she said, I've learned that even though I'm not in control, he is, and I'm comfortable with that. And I'm sitting in the back of the class thinking, wow, to hear a 15, 16, 17-year-old young woman who's going through and been through a difficult time to be able to express, I'm not in control, the Savior is, but I'm comfortable with that, that was a powerful moment because we allowed, or this great teacher allowed the student to think about and allow the spirit to connect the principle to their lives. That's, that's where teaching becomes magical, mm -hmm. and it's such an amazing, that is sacred space, yeah. sacred ground that you're walking on when, when experiences like that happen. And what a great invitation to, to ask them, how is this your story? What are the what are the things that you need to, to be comfortable with yeah. letting Jesus be in, in control of? Yeah, as you look at your fears, what beliefs do you have that allow you to overcome those fears or anxieties? Absolutely. Okay, now let's pick up uh, one more quick miracle. Going back now to Matthew chapter 9, this is the story, uh, Matthew chapter 9 opens with the man who is sick of the palsy, so he's paralyzed, and you, you could uh, ask them to look at verse 2, again, this search kinds of questions, these look for kind of questions to get them to engage with the scriptures. It's, it's start in first gear. 
It's basic, simple questions, but it's to get them going so they realize it's not just going to be a day where I sit back and zone out and, and be a passive observer. You could say there's a man with a serious problem who can't come to Jesus on his own. Why? What's his problem? Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, figure out what his problem is. So they're going to look, hopefully, and they're going to see sick of the palsy. Most of your students probably aren't going to know what the palsy is. Mm -hmm. So you say, figure it out. Some of them are going to look in their footnote and realize, oh, stroke paralysis is the Greek word. So he's paralyzed. He can't come unto Christ. And so now it's this idea of sometimes in our teaching, instead of always focusing 100% of the time on just the individual student, mm -hmm. if we're helping them become more like Christ, we want to help them look outside of themselves, to look to others. How can I help others to, to experience some of these things as well? And in this case, this man who is paralyzed has some friends who are willing to go to great effort to help bring this man to Christ, and then you could start asking them questions of what are some things that you could do to help people around you who maybe don't feel like they have the capacity or in some cases maybe even the desire to come unto Christ to be healed, and how could you help bring them? And in this case, they go to, they go to some pretty significant effort. You could have them looking for what are, what are the things these men have to do to get this man in a position in front of Christ, and then, and then, once they finally lower this man after great effort, what might your reaction be if you're one of the four, and instead of hearing, arise, be healed, what do you hear instead? Thy sins be forgiven thee. That's that's not what you had anticipated, this idea of be of good cheer, <laughs> thy sins be forgiven. It's like, wait, we brought him so that you would heal a paralysis. And then you could talk about what's the real miracle here? Is it the fact that Jesus raises this man so that he can now walk physically, or that Jesus took away sin from this man? Is, is one a miracle and the other just a sideshow? Or are they both miracles? One's just physical and the other's spiritual. And to help your, your students or your children recognize that not all of God's miracles are these big calming of the sea, curing of the leprosy, taking away disease, or restoring life to a dead body. Sometimes some of the most powerful miracles performed by Jesus in the lives of your children and your students today is forgiveness of sin. And you can talk about the, the beautiful miracle that takes place every Sunday at the sacrament table, and if they start seeing that as one of Jesus' most profound miracles, then they stop looking for the big, grand, and glorious and start recognizing his hand every week, every day in my life. I can experience the miracle of forgiveness. Yeah, and I really believe that you as teachers – um, yes, for sure, parents who are among the best teachers uh, are those four. When he was born of four, um, even as you're talking, Tyler, I'm thinking about my four children, and I'm thinking about teachers both at school and in seminary. I'm thinking about teachers of young men and young women that influence my children. I'm thinking about coaches and I'm so grateful for my wonderful children, but I can just see names and faces of those four that have, with my children, brought them to the Savior and allow, allowed them to be healed and to learn of Him. And yes, as parents, I hope we did well, but there is no way, if it, I think, if it were just left up to me and my sweet wife, we can help our children, but having those born of four other people to help children come to the Savior you're, you're some of them, and we sincerely thank you for all that you do to bless, uh, bless individuals and drop them down to the Savior so he can do the healing. That's powerful. So now, let's, uh, let's conclude Great. by going over to Matthew chapter 10, 
uh, a very, very significant chapter yeah. in the ministry of Jesus Christ because you'll notice it's not just about Jesus doing everything. Because let's be honest, Jesus being a, a resurrected, perfected, glorified God sitting in heaven today, he has the capacity. He could come and teach your class. He could come into your home. He could do every family evening lesson. He could come into our sacrament. He could give every sacrament meeting talk or every conference address. And quite frankly, it would be way better than what we do. He could go and he could teach your class for you, and it would be perfect. The students would love it, but he doesn't do that. He lets you give those lessons. He lets you give those family home evening discussions. He lets you give those sacrament meeting talks. Why? Why doesn't he just do all these things in perfect form? Well, chapter 10 is this chapter where he sets up this foundation of delegation of his authority and the commissioning of, of apostles to go and do the work, yeah. not because they're going to do it perfectly, but because they and the people they interact with are going to grow through those imperfect attempts to follow Christ. So with that backdrop, that's perfect to then ask questions like, okay, can we come up with the 15, the names of our first presidency in Korma, the 12 today? Uh, let's see how well we can do, and we go through and we see if we can name them. We then take them to Matthew chapter 10 and say, can you name the original 12? And this is a great opportunity, I think, to have youth grab their pencils, grab their phones, and highlight the names of the original 12. Um, it then could be another good search exercise. Again, we're practicing searching the scriptures take a few minutes and skim through these verses and see what invitations and training you can the saviors given given to these 12 as they're sent forth right that are sent forth they're to to teach the lost sheep to preach to heal to cleanse to raise to cast out let them find those training elements that the saviors given to the quorum of the 12. Um, it might be a fun exercise to say okay how many of you have met a member of the First Presidency in Quorum of the Twelve. Tell us about them. What do you know about them? Get them talking not only about the original Twelve, but the amazing men that lead us today in the First Presidency in Quorum of the Twelve and see if they've had experiences with them. Um, maybe to teach a doctrine or a principle, this might be a beautiful way to do it. Show a picture of a rivet. Maybe even bring a rivet to class or in your home and show them a rivet, and then use this statement by President M. Russell Ballard. Keep your eyes riveted on the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We will not lead you astray. We cannot. What a beautiful invitation for all of us is to, to be riveted to the direction, the teachings, of the First Presidency in Quorum of the Twelve. You might even, if you had time, you could invite them, if they have their phones, is to take three or four minutes and find a statement you love. Find a doctrine, find a truth from a member of the First Presidency or Quorum of the Twelve. Find that and be ready to share that with us. And now you've got members of your class saying, oh, I love this statement by Elder Holland. I love this statement by President Nelson, and we're having an opportunity now in class or in our home to where the living members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve, that we're able to see what they've sent forth to us today. So something you can do with this idea here is instead of feeling like you have to have every student go through every verse or cover every talk, it's kind of fun to either have them individually or pair them up or put them in groups of two or three or two, three or four, and you could block out certain sections of chapter 10 and have that individual or that small group go in and look for what are the, what are the principles that, that Jesus taught 
these apostles? What were, were the invitations or the commands that he gave them and why? And then you could transition into this part that you're talking with the, the words of our modern prophets and apostles. Have them get out their phones, go to the gospel library, and click on general conference, and then go to the very most recent general conference and pick one of the, the talks given by a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles or of the First Presidency, pick one, either individually or with their group, and have them go through and find something that they say, wow, this is – these prophets and apostles were sent by the Lord. That's what the word apostle means, to, to be sent. They were sent for us. What do we find in this talk that is actually very relevant? And to be able to share those and ask them to not just – so when they finish sharing it, say you, you can ask follow-up questions like, that sounds good. It, it sounds socially acceptable to say in this setting, but do you really believe that? And you'll find sometimes when asked appropriately, a student will pause, think about it, and then they'll come back with, yes, I do. And then you can ask follow-up questions of why? why. What have you experienced in your life to cause you to believe that? How do you know that's true? And now they can be sharing some experiences that they've had, and you're now connecting the scriptures with the living prophets, with their own life governed by whatever the Holy Ghost directs them, whatever direction the Holy Ghost takes them. Yeah, and I would hope as teachers or parents, maybe even at the beginning, this might be a challenge, as you begin – sometimes we run out of time, we look and we only have 30 seconds or the youth or the kids are getting a little antsy because we've been uh, studying or in class for a while. It may even be at the beginning of Matthew 10 to begin Matthew 10 with your testimony of how you know the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve, that they are prophets, seers, and revelators, and share what you know about them just to help them feel right at the beginning. We are so blessed, we are so fortunate that even though the Savior physically is not with us, he is called, he has sent forth 15 members of the First Presidency in Quorum of the Twelve to teach us and guide us today. And I know there is great safety in being riveted to these wonderful leaders. So one other thought as we consider prophets as we consider riveting our lives to their teachings is Matthew chapter 10, verse 20. Um, knowing that as teachers and as parents, we often feel overwhelmed. We're so excited and preparing for the perfect lesson, and sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. Matthew chapter 10, verse 20 is a great blessing for me as I consider the teaching and the learning in my life. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. As we teach, as we pray, as we study, as we prepare, as we water our pillow with tears at night to try and provide the best experiences for our children and for our youth and for those that we teach, may we remember that. May we recognize that the end result of all of our teaching and learning is to simply allow the Father to speak to the learner by the power of the Holy Ghost. May he be the central focus of everything we do as our prayer. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen.